Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the June 26, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.31 p.m. This is an in-person and live stream meeting format. The members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you have typed your name and that it reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak online use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask questions or comments. Reminder, during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates may speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your microphone and make sure that your microphone is lit when you are speaking. Um, please clearly uh, announce yourself and so your voice will amplify. Please uh, state your name and representation when asking a question or comment, as we have many new faces here. I'm looking forward to um, learning them all. And Dr. Cock is sending around a sign-in sheet right now. So please do sign in um, or please find it by the end of the meeting if you did not get that sign-in sheet um, so we can document your uh, being at this meeting. At this time, we will begin with the roll call for members and alternates uh, around the noon. Uh, please state your name and representation. And as a little bit of fun today, please let us know what you love about living or working in this region. And uh, we'll go around the room and we'll start with, uh, I believe, Ms. DeAndrea. Thanks for putting me on the spot first. <laughs> <laughs> Just wrapping my head around that. Um, I guess, oh, so Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge. And I guess the thing that I love best about working or living in this region is the great people that uh, are um, our colleagues. There we go. I'm Jeff Boyd. Uh, I'm representing the Two Creeks Neighborhood Organization. Uh, I've lived here all my life, and I just enjoy the weather. Jessica Mickledust, CDOT Region 1, and we have the peaks and we have the plains in Region 1 and Dr. Cog. In Sanson, City of Boulder, and um, what I love, I'm going to repeat what I already said, but I love all of the colleagues and the wonderful people that we all get to work with. Hillary Simmons with a little help, uh, senior special interest seat, and I love the 300 days of sun and seeing the mountains pretty much every day. Uh, Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of Jessica. Uh, Jefferson County is exactly that, the plains and the mountains, and that's what makes Jefferson County wonderful. Mike Whitaker, Jeffco, City of Lakewood. Um, they probably the collaboration we have in Jeffco is pretty nice. Art Griffith, Douglas County. Um, just enjoy working with all of you for so many years and uh, making regional improvements. I'm Wally Wirt, and having grown up in Chicago, what's not to like about living in Denver? <laughs> Alex Hydride, Boulder County, and I like the access to nature. Kent Mormon, uh, Adams County, City of Thornton and uh, like the climate here. Matt Williams with Douglas County. I like the four seasons we have here in Colorado. Not the hotel, I've never been there. <laughs> uh, Larry Nemo, City of Castle Pines, and I've got to meet Rick today who graduated two years before I did from Littleton High School, so that was pretty cool. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sean Poe with the City of Commerce City. Uh, it's obviously the weather, having lived in Texas the last 18 years. Also get to see my Bronco. Brian Weimer, Rappo County. Um, what's not to like about... Uh, 
Jonathan Webster, City and County of Denver, uh, The Natural Beauty. John Ferruzzi with the City of Armada, ditto. Pam Kennedy, Dr. Cog staff, uh, just the state's amazing. Where else could you bike, hike, rock climb, whitewater raft all in the same day? Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield, and uh, just the commitment to transportation in this region and the commitment to the collaboration. Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. Um, being from New Mexico, but having lived in Florida before moving back out west, I very much appreciate our climate here. Good afternoon, everybody. Ron Papstor from the Transportation Planning and Operations Director here at Dr. Cog. Really glad to see faces here around the table. Um, what I really enjoy about working in this region is the very the variation across the region among communities and among the trans. Terry Erickson, Douglas County, and I live in the rural part of Douglas County, and I love all the wildlife. And Jeff Dankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from the city of Centennial, and I enjoy the professional collaboration that we get to do. David Gasper, city and county of Denver. Uh, I'm, I'm an urbanist, guys, so I like walkable urban neighborhoods in Denver. Matt Callison, uh, Rappo County. Uh, the innovation and collaboration and creativity with all our colleagues. Uh, Justin Schmitz with uh, City of Lone Tree representing Douglas County. And I love, well, the Denver Nuggets right now, of course. And then also getting to work with our Griffiths. So. <laughs> Jim, Jim Kotzer, I work for Rappo County. Um, I love working with my boss, Brian Weimer. <laughs> no, I, it is. It's kind of, yeah. No, I love living in Colorado. My family lives here. Also hunting, fishing, very outdoors. Good afternoon. My name is Phil Greenwald. I'm the transportation planning manager with the city of Longmont in Boulder County. Um, I really appreciate all the friendships over the last years of working in this region. Thank you. Carson Priest, representing the TDM non-motorized um, position. Justin took my answer. I was just going to say, go Nuggets and pass it along. I'm Chris Chogan with Adams County. Uh, as a city liver downtown, I grew up in the suburbs outside of Atlanta, so it was a big change for me to move downtown. And I really like the walkability. I heard that earlier. Being able to, to be anywhere I need to be within about 10 minutes, except for Dr. Cog is 45 minutes. But that's a whole different thing. So don't worry about it. Josh Schwank, uh, Dr. Cog staff. I love being able to see the mountains every day. Lauren Curgis, Dr. Cog staff. My favorite thing, I think, is the people. Chris Quinn with RTD and the mountains for sure. Uh, Brody Ayers, the aviation special interest seat. Uh, the reason I moved to Denver was the concentration of aviation uh, in airports. So that's what I enjoy about. Rachel Holtine, Bicycle Corridor non-motorized seat. And I think uh, the thing that I love the most is just sort of the culture of uh, there's always something new and exciting going on. And especially in this world, there's a lot of sort of expansive opportunities to reimagine and we're all leaning into it. And I really appreciate that. Hi, I'm Marissa Gahan. I work for the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, I'm a Colorado native going back a few generations. So I'm just proud that I get to work with such passionate people and give back to the state so I can uh, have a good place for, for my family and my now fourth generation Colorado native. Fun. Yeah, I'm Jim Eusen uh, in Greeley, Region 4, CDOT. Uh, the thing I love most about uh, what I've been doing over the last 20 plus years is the people and like Phil said, the friendships that we've garnered over the years. And a lot of you are those people in the room right now and I'll never forget that, so. Uh, Rick Pilgrim, the environmentalist interest. And uh, I was one of the older people here. Uh, I've, I've spent most of my career here in uh, the Denver area in transportation and the fact that we get to work on some of the most interesting projects in the country 
this is a, a real career for, um, for all of us, and we make a big difference. And, you know, so working together and creating uh, a transportation system that works extremely well and is, is well integrated, uh, I think that's a credit to all that we do. Great, thank you all. We don't have mics in the back, but I do want to acknowledge we have several alternates sitting behind us. If you're a TAC alternate or a member, uh, raise your hand. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate having all of you here. Thank you, Jacob. Um, at this time, I want to turn it over. I believe it's Ron. Public or okay, not the introductions of the. Public comment first. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, we'll go to public. Excuse me. We'll go to public comment first, and uh, we'll now open up the meeting for public comment. Uh, public comment is limited to three minutes. And as a reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you join by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak in which you will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, the public comment period is um, only TAC members and alternates uh, will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. And at this time, do we have any public comment from anybody here in the room or online? Again, if you are online, feel free to raise your hand or if you're by phone, um, raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised uh, virtually or in person. I think we're okay. Great. Thank you. At this time, um, we will move on to the meeting summary of the May 22nd, 2023 uh, TAC meeting. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the May 22nd, 2023 TAC meeting? Okay, seeing none, then the summary will stand um, as it is in your agenda. And we'll moving on to, um, we're going to kind of mix up a little bit first, and we're going to do um, our informational briefing first with Dr. Cog and the Transportation Advisory Committee orientation. This is attachment B in your packet, and I'll hand it over to Jacob Rieger, a multimodal transportation planning manager. Um, Madam Chair, if you mind while while Jacob's getting settled in and ready I did I just wanted to um, take a moment Doug stole a, a lot of the thunder earlier and uh, kind of welcomed everyone here we really do appreciate that um, we felt like with the expansion of the membership with TAC a number of kind of we've had change over in membership and alternates over the last couple of years we're coming out of a couple of year pandemic period where we didn't get to see each other in person um, until uh, more recently. So really thought it was important for everyone to kind of get together and be able to meet each other and interact a little bit and also take, um, take this opportunity to do a little bit of an orientation into the Transportation Advisory Committee, its role. One of the beauties of the work that we do here in this region is through the collaboration that happens at this table through the Regional Transportation Committee and our Board of Directors. Um, our, our Board of Directors is somewhat unique in the kind of national metropolitan planning organization structure where every single member jurisdiction has a seat at that table. And it's, it's the strength of that collaboration and that representation that really helps us do really good work for this region. So, and you all play a really significant role in assisting the Regional Transportation Committee and the board in their decision-making efforts. So your presence here, your participation in TAC and the work that TAC does is really integral to the work that we do for transportation and transportation planning in this region. So I wanna thank you for your commitment to this group and hand it over to Jacob to give a little bit of an orientation. Great, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, good afternoon, everyone. Again, Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, I'm also the staff liaison for TAC. I manage TAC uh, with the help of a lot of great staff at Dr. Cog. Um, so for those of you new members or for existing members, anytime you have questions, uh, wanna reach out, I'm the person to uh, give a call or email to. So let's start with this. Um, how many of you, this is your first TAC meeting? 
Yeah, several of you. How many of you have been on TAC one to five years? Many of you. And how many of you who we really value, you're not old, you are, you are our institutions, have been on TAC more than five years? Awesome. So it's a really good mix of folks. Um, some of you know some of this, but we want all of you to know all of it. So hopefully you all know who Dr. Cog is. That's sort of first and foremost, but maybe a couple things that you didn't know about us. Um, first of all, our territory is vast. You all have talked about um, kind of the, the variation in our territory. We have all of it, all are parts of 10 counties. We have a um, geographic area that's the size of the state of Connecticut. It's a really vast area, almost three and a half million people within the Dr. Cog region. Um, we wear a lot of hats, um, both federal and state designations, three of our biggest ones. As you see at the bottom, we are the state designated regional planning commission uh, for this region. We are the area agency on aging for most of the Dr. Cog region. Boulder County also has an area agency on aging and Weld County has an area agency on aging. And for our purposes today and for the purposes of the work that you do here at TAC, we are the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for the greater Denver region. I'll talk more about what that means in a moment. So kind of the philosophy of Dr. Cog and the way that we're set up and structured, uh, regional success depends on partnership. Uh, we are not a regulatory agency for the most part. We are charged to do many things under federal and state law. Uh, with some exceptions, we don't really build or operate things. We are a convener. We bring people together. We set priorities. We allocate funding. We work together to solve regional problems. Um, as it says, we're a bridge between partner jurisdictions and agencies best practices. So we really try and bring you all together to tackle the big regional issues that we're all working on and work together to find solutions. Our lovely animated slide, some of you have seen this, but just a snapshot of kind of our big picture planning structure. It starts with our Metro Vision plan, which is like your local government comprehensive plans. It is the aspirational vision plan. Uh, for what do we want to be in this region in the future? What is, what is our long-term vision? Um, so that's our Metro Vision Plan that includes a lot of topics, including transportation. We are federally charged with creating what we call the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it helps implement Metro Vision, but it also satisfies our state and federal requirements around multimodal transportation planning. Uh, one of those big or two of those big federal requirements is that within that plan, we need to have what they, what the feds call fiscally constrained or a cost feasible transportation plan. We need to be able to say, you know, of all the things that we want and need and desire in this region over the long term, what can we actually afford um, to build, to operate, to maintain over time? And then overlaying all of that, um, well, let me come. So we have our long range regional transportation plan, which is currently our 2050 regional transportation plan. And then we have our four year transportation improvement program, which is actually out for public comment. So please comment on our new 24 to 27 transportation improvement program. That is very much like a local government's capital improvements program. What are we funding? What are we building now in this region over the next four years? The TIP implements the regional transportation plan. That's by federal law. And overlaying both of those documents and our work as a transportation agency is another sort of federal clunky term, air quality conformity. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but we have federal requirements around um, the work that we do demonstrating compliance with air quality conformity standards for several criteria pollutants, um, given the air quality issues we have in this region. So we have a lot of federally directed responsibilities. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I just really wanna make clear, we are the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the greater Denver region. There are five MPOs in Colorado. There are approximately, I think around 330 or so MPOs in this country. Any urban area, 50,000 or greater, gets designated by the federal government as a metropolitan planning organization. An MPO is charged under federal law with leading the region's multimodal transportation planning process. But we do that in partnership. We do it in particular in partnership with CDOT and RTD under a federal term called the 3C planning process. There will be a quiz on this at the end. The continuing cooperative and comprehensive transportation planning process that's called for under federal law, but frankly, and I have a partnership slide, we frankly do it in partnership with all of you, all of our local governments, all of our stakeholder agencies, the public, um, but that is our role as the MPO to lead multimodal transportation planning together with all of you in the greater Denver region. We also have a lot of state directed uh, responsibilities. I'll go through a couple of these. As I said, we are the regional, the designated regional planning commission. 
Uh, we are empowered uh, to make and adopt regional plans like MetroVision. Um, I've talked about our long-range plan, our 20-year um, long-range transportation plan. Um, we, For those of you that were here last year, we spent a lot of time on the new greenhouse gas transportation planning standard, which is a new requirement of the State Transportation Planning Commission. We're responsible for fulfilling that as the MPO. Um, we also have a couple legislative responsibilities. We must approve any fixed guideway transit system proposed by RTD uh, before construction can proceed. Uh, when I started here 12 years ago as a transit planner, that was a big part of my job. Under State Senate Bill 90-208 is where that authority comes from. We also have some state and, frankly, some federal kind of legislative authority around reviewing roadway tolling proposals before they go in the regional transportation plan. Oh, and actually, sorry, I don't want to gloss over something that's really important. That very last bullet, we have representation on the statewide transportation advisory committee known as STAC. STAC is the committee that advises the Transportation Commission at CDOT. It is comprised of all of the MPOs in Colorado, but really all of the transportation planning regions, of which we are one, and there are 15 transportation planning regions in Colorado, so that's important as well. All right, as a metropolitan planning organization, I think I kind of covered this, um, operation and maintenance of the continuing transportation planning process within the metropolitan planning area, um, which is from the map, kind of our urban, urban counties uh, within the greater Denver region. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, regulatory compliance, maintain eligibility for federal funding, such as through our transportation improvement program process. We create, and in fact, we're soon to adopt our new unified planning work program, which is our kind of agency staff two-year work plan. What are we going to work on as an MPO? How are we going to spend federal planning dollars for the planning work that we do? Um, talked a little bit about the Transportation Improvement Program. And then, as I said, overlaying all of this are the federal requirements around air quality conformity. Whenever we update or amend or create a new regional transportation plan, and via that as well, the Transportation Improvement Program, we need to certify um, that those plans are compliant with federal air quality conformity requirements. It's a really important um, and, frankly, complicated part of the work we do here. Um, we do some other things as well. I won't go through all of these, but whether it's data, whether it's services that we provide, we maintain the region's traffic model, our focus model. Uh, we're starting to get into some corridor community-based transportation planning. Uh, we've done scenario planning. We have a whole traffic operations uh, program at Dr. Cog that's very unique in the country. There's only a few MPOs that directly work on traffic operations, and we do that here. Um, we also work with our transportation management agencies and organizations, um, and we have our regional traffic count database as well as a wealth of other data, crash data, other data that we maintain and make available for the region. Um, so here's that partnership slide. I uh, won't go through all these um, agencies, but really, again, it's the local, the regional, the state, and the federal agencies. Um, you all have membership on TAC. Uh, we work together with all of you um, to carry out our regional transportation planning work in this region, and we appreciate those partnerships very much. It's how we get things done in this region. So I briefly mentioned MetroVision. I just want to go through it really quickly because it is our foundational vision plan uh, for the future. Um, as it says, MetroVision is the region's plan to ensure a high quality of life for all ages, incomes, and abilities. The Dr. Gog board unanimously adopted MetroVision back in 2017, and we occasionally amended and updated as necessary. Um, there, are, there is a transportation theme of MetroVision. All residents have access to a range of transportation, employment, commerce, housing, educational, cultural, and recreational opportunities in this region. And many of you spoke about this in your introductions, how important this is. Um, particularly around transportation, investments in infrastructure and amenities allow people and businesses to thrive and prosper in this region. The region has clean water and air and lower greenhouse gas emissions. The regional transportation system is well-connected and serves all modes of travel. The built and natural environment supports healthy and active choices in this region. And the transportation system is safe, reliable, and well-maintained. These are kind of our foundational statements. I think they jive with many of your all's plans and your all's work for how we conduct transportation planning in this region. I mentioned our 2050 regional transportation plan. It's the most important thing we do at Dr. Cog. I'm kidding, but my team does it, so of course I think it's the most important. 
But the 2050 plan really does set that framework of our priorities, our multimodal priorities. What do we want this region to be from a multimodal transportation perspective? It brings together everything that we do in this region, regardless of funding source, regardless of agency, regardless of who maintains or operates the system. So whether it's RTD and transit, whether it's all the great work that RTD does, whether it's all of you local governments and your paving and the work that you do, whether it's our transportation improvement program and the things that we fund, regardless of funding source, regardless of project type, it's all together here in the regional transportation plan. We adopted the 2050 RTP back in April of 2021. And then based on the new state greenhouse gas transportation planning standard, we updated the plan last year. My board adopted it last September. So this is our current um, plan that we update every four years per federal law. Um, this is our transportation or multimodal transportation plan for the region. Um, our transportation improvement program, many of you are familiar with, and probably you think that's the most important thing we do because that's how we allocate funding for projects. Again, the TIP implements the RTP. The major projects that are included within the transportation improvement program, regardless of mode, are only eligible to compete for funding in the TIP if they are first in the RTP, and that is under federal law. And I want to underscore the importance of the RTP in setting that framework of priorities for the region and the importance of the TIP in working together and how we allocate funding together in this region um, towards those multimodal projects through our TIP process. All right, this complicated org chart is our Transportation Planning and Operations Division at Dr. Cog. If you are Dr. Cog staff, raise your hand. These are the people that make it happen. It's not me. It's all those smart people sitting in the back that do all the good work here. These are the folks that make this region what it is and working with all of you. So I'm not going to go through all these, but I wanted to show you our updated org chart. Like many MPOs across the country, through both the challenges and the opportunities afforded under the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as some state requirements, like the greenhouse gas work and some other things I've mentioned, we have had the opportunity to grow our staff over the last year, year and a half. So this is how our staff is organized in terms of the major programmatic areas that our staff works on. Uh, we have long-range folks. We have short-range folks. We have folks who work on um, mobility analytics, telling stories with data, um, our traffic operations group, active and emerging mobility, um, bike ped technology, all of those sorts of things. So we've got the whole sort of gamut. Um, anytime that you have questions or need something, chances are our staff knows it or can help you help you with that issue. So let's talk a little bit about the MPO and our organizational structure. We recently updated a document that we now call our framework for transportation planning in the Denver region. Some of you know it as our uh, prospectus document is what we used to call it. Um, this is on our website. I would encourage you to check it out. I may have linked to it in the memo. Um, it's, it's Transportation 101. In plain English, it explains the metropolitan transportation planning process, how we all work together, and the major products and processes that, that come out of that. Um, again, the Metropolitan Planning Agreement, uh, sorry, we also, in addition to that, by federal law, have a Metropolitan Planning Agreement that sort of implements that 3C transportation planning process between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. And what's kind of unique here is Ron kind of hinted at the beginning, we have our board of directors that functions as our MPO board, but we also have our regional transportation committee that you all advise, and I'll talk about that in a second. But kind of unique here to Dr. Cog is that our RTC in our board, when they're acting on MPO things like approving the long-range plan or approving the transportation improvement program funding decisions, um, when it's an MPO action, our RTC and board have to take the same action. And if they take a different action, it has to go back to one or both of them until they sort of reconcile and come up with the same, uh, the same motion. So that's part of our MPO work. So we have our board of directors, as you all know, 56 local governments, 58 member board of directors. Everyone in the 10 county Dr. Cog region um, gets to be a member of Dr. Cog, gets to have a seat at the table. So that's our board of directors. Um, the Regional Transportation Committee is primarily, again, that 3C planning process. Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, uh, RAC is on there. Um, there's a couple other folks as well. Um, you all advise RTC and RTC advises the board in concert, as I said, um, in terms of taking action. And then you all, so you all at TAC, local governments, nine special interest seats, um, our partner agencies like CDOT and RTD and others, you all form um, RTC, or excuse me, TAC. Um, and then we also have a few ad hoc committees and some work groups to help us do our work as well. So specifically to you all, uh, Ron kind of covered this already, but 
any of the MPO work we do, any of the major sort of products, the plans, the processes, when we're working on our when we're working on our long range plan, we're working on our transportation improvement program, all the major things that we work on that we produce, we bring to you first. You help us, you guide us, you advise us, you review the work that we do, and on action items, you make recommendations to the Regional Transportation Committee, who then makes recommendation to the board uh, for approval of a product or, or a particular action item. So some fun facts about all of you. 21 local government members now on TAC. We have nine special interest seats. These are folks like freight, um, environment, housing. Jeff, glad to have you here. Um, others um, who are related to transportation and help us in our work. So we have nine of those special interest seats. Um, 10 transportation planning partners, so folks like RTD, CDOT, 2X officio non-voting members, those are the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration are part of TAC as well. So when you add it all up, based on our configuration today, uh, 40 TAC members, 38 of you are voting. So it takes a, a simple majority, so 20 members um, is a quorum for this group now, and 20 votes to carry an action. So with our expanded TAC, this is what we look like now. Um, so back in, I think, February, we did a mentee exercise um, sort of anticipating this expansion where we just kind of felt you out a little bit in terms of like what kind of topics and what kind of agenda items would you be interested in kind of seeing over time. So we linked to this in the packet or included in the packet, but just wanted to show you kind of a snapshot of some of the things that we heard from you. Um, now that we're in our larger group, we'll probably come back and do this exercise again, um, but just want to keep that conversation going in terms of Here's some of the things that you told us that you care about, either that you'd like us to present about or maybe things that you all could present to us about things that you're doing in your communities. So finally, this is Ron Papstorf after, after his first week at Dr. Cog when he realized what he got himself into. Uh, we say that these are the issues keeping us up at night. These are really just the issues that we're tackling, that you're tackling, some of the major things that we're focused on and we know that you're focused on. As I said, we are actually soon to adopt our new our next two-year unified planning work program, which lays out as an agency, as a staff, the kinds of planning things that we're going to work on as an agency in partnership with you all. And many of these things are in um, that new UPWP that we're continuing to tackle together in partnership with you. All right, so that was a lot, but I hope that gave you a good grounding both to Dr. Cog, our MPO work, and to you all as a Transportation Advisory Committee. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Rigger, for that overview. Is there any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? You think you covered that really well for us, Jacob. Thank you very much for that overview and welcome to all of our new members here today. Okay, we are now moving on to the action item on our agenda. We have one action item for today. This is item four, fiscal year 2022 to 2023 unified planning work program amendment. This is attachment C in your packet and I am going to hand it off to Andy Taylor, regional planning and analytics manager. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and attention this afternoon. Um, hopefully I can keep this short, um, but I'm here to answer questions when I'm through with this. Um, I have a proposed amendment to our unified planning work program here at Dr. Cog in front of you today for your consideration that would explicitly add housing coordination planning activities into our regional transportation planning process. Uh, housing and transportation, these have always been connected. Uh, they're connected in our daily lives, traveling from home to work to school to other destinations. Uh, where we live affects the different travel choices and modes that may be available or feasible or how far we have to travel to meet our daily needs. Our approach at Dr. Cog uh, has long woven in uh, these together in our planning work, uh, connecting growth and development uh, and uh, into infrastructure decisions back in our first regional plan uh, toward greater livability back in 1963, uh, developing scenarios for different growth and development patterns alongside uh, different transportation network investment alternatives back in 1995, 2007, 2013, 2020. Uh, we also do a lot of work to connect key geographies throughout our region uh, to planning and investment decisions. These might be 
uh, for example, locally identified and regionally designated urban centers in Metrovision or pedestrian focus areas in the Dr. Cog Active Transportation Plan. Uh, what's changed actually is language in the United States Code. So uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, Congress added a key word uh, to one of the items our uh, regional transportation planning process must consider. Uh, they added the word housing. So uh, what the process must consider among other things is to promote consistency between transportation improvements and state and local plan growth, housing and economic development patterns. Uh, one might argue that uh, housing was already implied uh, when it mentioned growth previously, uh, but now it's explicit. Uh, further, Congress outlined a housing coordination approach uh, metropolitan planning organizations like Dr. Cog uh, can consider. Uh, much of the language in the proposed amendment before you today echoes that section outlined by Congress. Uh, the projects and strategies that could come out of uh, this type of work are wide ranging. Uh, this goes beyond just planning for more transit-oriented development. Uh, housing choices or lack thereof in many cases have a subsequent impact on millions of daily travel choices. So maybe it's about uh, existing employment centers, areas in and around different urban or activity centers, uh, or where there may be opportunities for more and diverse housing types uh, in those locations, whether it's uh, transit-oriented or not. Uh, so in order to start the process to procure consultant services uh, to support housing coordination planning here at Dr. Cog, uh, we need a motion to recommend this amendment to the Unified Planning Work Program. I'm happy to turn it back over to the chair if there are any questions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, are there any questions or comments from the TAC? Uh, Mr. Weimer. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. I noticed on bullet point two, combine state and local entities for all of this. I suggest that you split those up because there are different responsibilities among what the state has and what local have with housing, affordability, economic development. And given what we went through this last legislature, I think I don't want to imply that the state has responsibility for land use. Although I do recognize that that will likely come back with this document, I think you need to bifurcate that the point and separate out responsibilities. Yeah, that is language that we did uh, borrow straight from United States code in that case, but I do see that point in, in work we could take forward after this. Um, this is why we're bringing this for work forward now is so we can have some of these conversations uh, so that um, uh, local viewpoints can become part of that process uh, more fully um, as the state brings these issues back up. Thank you. Mr. Mormon? A couple of things. First, um, you mentioned that it's now in the federal law that housing specific. I would suggest that you make that during this amendment that per this section of law, in other words, cite the cite the provide the citing of, of the change. Story um, there, and then this second item is I think bullet number four needs to go away and. The reason I believe that it needs to go away is one, I think it goes against what House Bill 1255 about not restricting growth, and this seems to restrict growth to certain areas. Two, I think this could undo our sub-regional area um, system that we have because a lot of places aren't served by public transit. And three, this is very vague on planned transit. Is it? RTD's planned transit service? Is it CDOTs? Is it the local jurisdictions? Is it the sub-regional service councils? Is it Dr. Cog's plan? So I think it's too vague and I think it's too restrictive on housing as and goes against state law. So I just recommend that bullet four go away. Yeah, I'll just, I'll add to that that um, with bullet four, again, there's a lot of text in here that we're, we're pulling straight from uh, United States code. Um, 
In terms of uh, what this can consider, uh, this is really just to get the work started. The scope of actual uh, projects and tasks to implement this um, still isn't written yet, and so uh, I'm happy to take these considerations in, into that as well. I just think since the entire region is not served directly by transit that you're you're really honing this into only favor areas that have existing transit. Uh, Mr. Pastor. Thank you. I, I did want to just take a moment um, to address uh, Ken's, Ken's comment. Uh, comment. Um, first of all, remember your orientation presentation. This is about the Unified Planning Work Program and the work that we perform as a metropolitan planning organization under federal law. So the work that we're doing in the UPWP that we're using federal planning funds to conduct, it's implicit in the UPWP that those it is under federal law. It is under the federal authority. We do mention it. So I don't think we need to add that to the language. It would be redundant because the UPWP already captures that, right, Kent? So. Uh, that I think it would be redundant to add it into this language because UPWP already speaks to our work as a awesome planning organization, federal law, and using federal funds. And we're using federal planning funds to do this work, which is why we're bringing forward the amendment to the UPWP, which enables to do, us to do the work. The other thing I think on, on bullet four is really important to to keep in this in this task list. It's not restrictive; it is expansive. It's, it's about identifying opportunities and gets to maximizing the efficiency of the transportation system. And yes, it, partly it mentions public transportation or transit, but it's, it's the whole transportation system. It's not just transit. And, it, and it, it is about our regional transportation plan and our metropolitan planning work, which is inclusive of everyone's. It's not restricted just to RTD transit service. It could be local transit service. It could be paratransit services. But it's also the broader transportation system at large. It's not just transit. This is not just about putting housing next to transit. This is about being efficient with our broader transportation investments in order to leverage your local land use, housing development, economic development goals and plans. So that's really what this is about. It's about coordinating those efforts. It's not about restricting efforts. It's not about saying development can only happen in this area or that area. This is about giving, doing work together to identify opportunities that are efficient for both transportation investments and development and housing and economic development. But I think if you take, if you take bullet four out of this, we, we're basically not doing the work then. If I may respond, um, on, on the first item, if, if you want to just put it in the um, notes when you send this on up in the, in the write-up that this is in citing the issue, that's fine as opposed to UPWA. And the second, I, I just have to disagree with you. Um, I think that this very specifically limits transportation projects and housing projects next to transit. Maybe it needs to be rewritten, but that's, that's the way I, I read this. That's, that's the way I read it, and I'm afraid others will read it that way also. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weart? The only thing I would add to the discussion is housing and urban growth or rural requires the ability for delivery of goods and services. And I think if you lose sight of that in your overall planning process, you'll create more congestion problems and along more expenses for actually providing those goods and services just from a transporta freight transportation service standpoint. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holtine. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sort of curious how this, um, how this works with the greenhouse school gas rule adoption. Um, I don't see any of the um, air quality or greenhouse gas emissions as any of the goals or standards that are within this and considering that that calls out land use as one of the strategies for success. I'm just curious how this meets the greenhouse gas rule implementation. Sure, I can, I can answer part of that and, and Ron, feel free to, to chime in as well. Um, this is part of the, the broader Unified Planning Work Program document, which does address 
many of those other uh, relationships here. Um, the item that I would draw your attention to is specifically, I think it's the, um, the fifth bullet point about identifying uh, strategic priorities for potential integration in these other planning documents. That's really where this work, we see it coming back to the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, which is where that greenhouse gas planning work actually lives. And so trying to find additional opportunities that we can further that work, um, uh, that will still take part in that uh, planning process, but that's really where we see that, that connection probably the strongest here. Thanks. I think I would just point out, like in the first bullet, it says uh, assess regional housing needs and opportunities that have a significant role in growth housing and economic development patterns contributing to growth in regional travel demand. Um, I mean, we've adopted and acknowledged that it also impacts our greenhouse gas emissions. And so I just feel like we haven't specifically anywhere in here called that out. And um, I mean, I trust Dr. Cog on the back end, but if this is going out for an RFP, um, it just feels like that climate impact is something for consideration. Yeah, this, this language itself wouldn't be going out necessarily as um, an RFP itself. This is just so that we can begin that process as well. So we can definitely add uh, those types of considerations there. Mr. Chauvin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, support Kent's comments on bullet four. Uh, my elected officials are still sensitive from the greenhouse gas discussion last year and the 213 discussion this year. Uh, to paraphrase, one of my elected officials, Denver and Boulder, have had their growth time, and now it's the rest of ours time. And when you start to talk about development restricting around transit centers, transit stations, or what have you, so my recommendation to staff as we go forward is perhaps soften the language that the federal put out there. Soften it a little bit more to accept more development patterns that are not exclusive around a transit corridor. I'd also like to back up Brian's point on bullet two. Perhaps you soften the language there to talk about subject matter experts rather than specific state or local. Brian, I'm not implying to change the wording on your behalf, but just offering a suggestion that would soften up that language just a little bit more. I understand that it was taken from the federal guidance, but sometimes the federal guidance is very narrow focused and we need to adjust and adapt based on our region, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, so I'm not quite sure at this point if there are some any recommended um, comments. Okay, we'll uh, start with a motion here. Um, so the motion that is proposed in your agenda is move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the amendment to the FY 2022 to 2023 Unified Work plan, uh, Unified Planning Work Program. Mr. Pilgrim. Uh, I'll make that motion. A motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Gaspers. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor. Now, again, we have a lot of new faces. So um, those, oh, I'm sorry, uh, any, any comment on this uh, motion? Mr. Weimer. I will be voting against this as presented based on my comments and what Mr. Mormon's comments. Any additional comments? Brian, can you say that again? Pardon me. That I will be voting against this motion as presented without the modifications that were suggested and with the uh, some of the comments that Mr. Mormons had made. Um, and be, um, Mr. Pilgrim. I would encourage members, if you don't agree with the, the written text here, then to propose a, an amendment or a change to that, if that's appropriate at this time, Madam Chair.
Ron? Um, so I, I think on bullet two, I'd move an amendment on the fly, come up with a little bit of wording. Three, Brian, that there are state entities that are responsible for economic development, housing, and transportation. So, oh. I, 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 I understand, I understand, yeah, I understand, Brian, land use, land use is important here. It, 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 I don't think this is implying that state has any more land use authority or responsibility than they currently have. I understand the sensitivity. I'm trying to figure out a way to adjust the language here to address this issue, but also realize that there is a, there's a state role in these conversations around housing, coordin housing coordination and transportation. I think the simple way of doing that is just break it into two separate bullets, one that identifies what the state responsibilities are and one that specifies what local agency responsibilities are. So I'm going to suggest amending that language in that bullet to read, consult with state entities responsible for economic development, housing, and transportation and local entities responsible for land use, economic development, housing, and transportation, as well as other appropriate entities. I could support that. That's a, that's a motion to amend the motion. I would second that for that bullet. A motion and a second on the amendment. Uh, second from Mr. Mormon. Any additional comments? Afterward. Uh, motion maker, Mr. Pilgrim, do you have any uh, comment? No. <laughs> no. Uh, that's acceptable to me, and I would ask if the second is uh, acceptable to that person. And Mr. Gaspers? Mr. Gaspers agrees. Mr. Papsdorf? I do want to I, want, I do want to address the fourth bullet, and I, and I'm I'm I I, I want to I want to understand the concerns, and I, I think I understand the the idea behind the concerns. Reading the language, I'm struggling to see the concern in the language. There there I'm I'm not seeing any words in here that specifically say any or desire any restrictions on development or housing around public transportation. It it does use transportation improvements as the very broad term. It is about leveraging transportation investments at large with our broader development goals in the region and making efficient decisions there and coordinating those things together. It's not, nothing in here, uh, I think, says any words about restricting transportation investments to certain areas or restricting development to certain areas. Um, it really is about just coordinating those planning efforts together here. I, I'm very concerned about completely removing bullet four. If there are um, if there are ideas on how to change the language to address some of those concerns, I think those those make sense. But eliminating eliminating bullet four essentially removes the removes the word. Mr. Mormon. My, my concern is is public transportation services because I read public transit services or thereof, and I, in the past when we've had this type of language come through through Dr. Cog, all of a sudden we have growth prohibitions, et cetera. In the past, I know it's not saying it, Ron, but I see where it goes to in the, and uh, we fought that very hard to eliminate that in the past. And I'd hate to start down that road again. I'm also concerned that all of a sudden, oh, now we're going to base our tip off. You know, we have this beautiful formula, and we've got the subregional. I see this going down the path of, oh, well, you don't have public transportation services, specifically public transit services, and therefore um, you don't get. It, we're going to redistribute the money differently, and I see that as an issue. And uh, I'm just looking down the road of, of how this gets implemented. So I, I think we have to be very careful. Now, maybe 
it needs to be clear in there. Um, but when you start um, saying higher density, well, what is higher density? Is it downtown Denver or is it where we have apartment and townhomes in our current locations? Um, there's a lot of density being built out there. You know, even our single family homes today are closer together than they were 20 years ago. Yards are smaller and it is more dense. So I, I, I just think this is um, going down a, down a rabbit hole that could really cause a lot of issues. Mr. Papsdorf? Thank you. Thank you for the dialogue, Ken. I, I appreciate um, that additional explanation. Um, a, little, a little bit of context, right? I, we all know that some of this is coming um, as a result of and under the cloud of the discussions during the legislative session around Senate Bill 213. Part of the reason we're bringing this forward is because our board, four members, are asking us to do this work because we want to inform future state discussions about how better to address land use and development and housing in this region, rather than a state mandate, a conversation with local jurisdictions in this region about where it's appropriate to do certain things and how to do things in a more context sensitive way, rather than a blanket mandate, thou shalt do this here, right? So this gives us the opportunity to have that conversation. So that's part of the context for this work and why some of that some of the wording is in here, but also because we're using federal transportation dollars to help fund this work, we have to reflect some of the some of the words that are in state statute under the bipartisan infrastructure law. With that said, to address one of your key points, I would suggest that in line six of the fourth bullet, just strike the work, strike the words public transportation so that that portion of that sentence will now say, in proximity to existing and planned transportation facility and services. I, I could live with that. I'm wondering if we should add also in there that this is to help inform, because um, that's the other concern was the way I read this is, state legislature could read this and say, oh, you guys are all for Senate Bill 213. And I know they aren't. Uh, we, we know our board we're, I think is not we're pretty, I think we're pretty clearly on the record about so, that, Ken. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I know they aren't. But I just, maybe we need to add something in there to help inform form, uh, uh, discussions on how it's statewide housing issues. Good thought. Weimer. It'd be easier to simplify it a little bit. Where I go with that is maybe it's, you know, the transport, um, something to the effect of permitting the transportation planning process to address the integration of housing, transportation, economic development strategies through a process that provides effective integration, including, including by developing a housing coordination plan. Would that address the issue in a more global sense in opening it up? Because I think that's what you're trying to do here, to integrate housing and transportation. I think that's what the legislation was trying to do. Um, I was trying to follow where that suggestion would go. Is that for the to, to strike out and replace a bunch of this? That would be an option. So that that addition would be to which section? This are we still in the fourth bullet, or are we before that? So striking, replacing much of the fourth bullet.
Yeah, I, I think the proposal was to replace much of this fourth bullet with um, the, what, what you just said. Um, I didn't catch it all, um, but simplifying it significantly. So I got as far as uh, permitting the transportation planning process uh, to address the integration of housing, uh, transportation, and economic development through a process that, that's about as far as I. Economic development strategies through a process that provides for effective integration, including by developing a housing coordination plan. Yes, I say that from this perspective of, I believe the bill really was talking about housing and integration of housing with transportation in the planning process. So does that cover it within paragraph there? Obviously the actual work may include some of this outcome, but that gives you an overall view of what you're trying to accomplish when you submit this to the feds. So the, the amendment would be to re replace uh, this bullet point with that language, or uh, am I not? Yes. Okay. I think that's a suggestion that could be to uh, accomplish what Kent was trying to identify. So I tried to simplify it a little bit. This goes into a lot of detail. The suggestion. Uh, Brian, I, I like the simplification idea. I, I'm kind of looking to the Dr. Cog staff to see what their reaction is, but uh, simplification I think is, is helpful. I think it also provides some flexibility for staff as they actually develop, uh, let's say an RFP or a, a strategy uh, process to go forward. It gives them more flexibility. They could they could come back to these same sorts of terms and and ideas in order to to take the next steps. But at this point, um, I, I think your your framework uh, for me works pretty well. I wouldn't call it. Let me let me say my one uh, reluctance is at the very end to call it a, a housing coordination plan. Uh, I think it's a regional coordination. Uh, re regional housing strategy. They already used the word strategy before, so I, uh, you know, um, integration process uh, to to result in a, a coordinating regional coordinated housing strategy. I don't know something something like that. I think that would work. But Madam Chair, my but my question to uh, Dr. Cog staff, if that sounds. Mr. Papster?
Sorry, you you stopped talking too fast. I was still trying to write on the fly some some new. Um, I mean, I, what, when in the course of human events. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 appreciate the, I appreciate the effort to simplify. I think what, so just by way of explanation, so you understand, we're, we're obviously this is something new. We're, tr we're, we're intending to use federal transportation planning dollars to fund a good chunk of this work, which was why we were being deliberate about trying to reflect specific language from the housing coordination planning section that's in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, We'll work with CDOT to defend a, a, a more simplified approach to this uh, with our federal partners uh, once it's approved. But in the in the vein of simplifying the language, um, here's my suggestion for a new bullet four to replace this. Um, develop a housing transportation coordination plan that integrates housing, transportation, and economic development strategies in the regional transportation planning process. That amendment, amendment two. I, I move the amendment to the motion. Um, any uh, comments on that from the motion maker, Rick Pilgrim? Oh, that's acceptable. Seconder, David Gaspers. Acceptable to both the motion maker and the second. Any further comments, Mr. Mormon? I can support that. Um, and that was the second um, motion amendment, because we have two of those. Okay, okay. any further uh, questions, comments, discussion? Just want to make sure. So again, two two amendments to the motion. The first is the language around state and local or state or local um, that we read earlier. The second is the language that Ron just read. Those are the two amendments to this motion that the motion maker and seconder have accepted. That would be the motion right now that you would vote on. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. Again, that first one was for the separation of bullet number two between uh, state and state responsibilities and local responsibilities, and then the simplification of bullet four that Ron just read. Um, and so uh, since we have a lot of new faces here, um, the those that vote are the voting representatives and any alternates that are here representing uh, their main uh, representative. Any further questions, comments, discussion? Okay. Uh, we have the motion and the two amendments. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstentions? Thank you very much for the discussion today. The motion uh, and amendments pass unanimously. Thank you to Dr. Cogstaff and for the discussion here today. And we'll go back to our agenda for um, informational briefing. This is item number six, fiscal year 2024 to 2027, Transportation Improvement Program Corridor Planning Set-Aside Update. Uh, this is attachment D in your packet. And I will pass it on to uh, Ms. Nora Kern, Sub-Area and Project Planning Program Manager for Dr. Cog. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, shifting tax a little bit. Um, just a little refresher for those of you who are new to TAC or weren't here last month, but uh, we have started a new corridor planning program here at Dr. Cog. Um, we started with a pilot program, which um, <coughs> through which we're, we're starting two corridor studies on Alameda Avenue and South Boulder Road. And so the goal of this program more broadly is to um, it's for Dr. Cog to really kind of step up and help take a leadership role in advancing some planning studies on some of the key regional corridors in the region. So, as I mentioned last time, we um, like I said, this is focused on projects specifically that are in the regional transportation plan. So um, there are kind of a number of projects, and we kind of 
honed in on the four categories of projects. If you want to Google the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, there's actually a map that you can pull up if you prefer a visual uh, display, and you can see kind of a snapshot of what that map looks like. But these four categories that we are kind of focused on are the projects that are categorized as multimodal capital projects, the regional bus rapid transit corridors, the corridor transit planning projects, and the arterial safety regional vision zero projects. So there's a lot of great um, projects identified on, on this list that are kind of in these four categories. A lot of them kind of speak to and will help the region fulfill some of the broader goals and, and kind of general priorities that are in the plan. And so um, we're excited to kind of take a, on a larger role in helping um, the region and working with a lot of, a lot of you all in, in kind of diving into some planning efforts on these types of corridors. So we, as I mentioned, we've had our pilot program. Um, we had about $500,000 to do our first kind of two studies. We're really excited to work with folks in Boulder County on South Boulder Road any, starting any day now, and then working with uh, Aurora, Lakewood, Denver, and Glendale on the Alameda Avenue study. And we are now kind of looking ahead to the, to the next phase of the program. And that's where I was hoping to get some feedback from you all on kind of our, our suggested way to proceed. So um, in the upcoming tip, um, we have a, a new quarter planning set aside, um, which this will be one of our kind of new set aside programs. Dr. Cog is going to retain the funds and then work with you all to kind of select projects and work with the region to select projects um, that will help lead. So we have um, an estimated $3 million identified for the four years of the TIP. Um, we intend to kind of split that into two two-year cycles, so about, a, about one and a half more or less each um, cycle. <laughs> And um, we're, we're now, because the tip is kind of coming up here pretty soon, we're going to go ahead and start thinking about what corridors make sense for us to, to help planning with planning on in the, the coming two years. So rough process is, is detailed below, but generally speaking, um, we are planning on having a call for letters of interest this summer um, in which we invite any jurisdiction to nominate a corridor that they think would be a good fit for this corridor planning program. These would be corridors that um, the local governments feel like there could be some, some um, benefit in having Dr. Hogg help manage, help fund studies. Um, and I should know these studies are really focused more on kind of the earlier planning stages. So there's a lot of great planning work happening around the region. We're not trying to duplicate efforts. Um, some, some of the projects like, for example, East Colfax BRT are, of course, well along their way. So we're not kind of talking about those types of projects. We're talking about corridors that are identified. Um, but need some work to kind of get to the next stage. So um, to inform the letter of interest this time around, we, we had a kind of a similar version about six months ago for the pilot program, but we decided we wanted to give it a little bit more guidance because there's so many quarters in the region and it was a little confusing last time. So we've actually prepared um, kind of a, a draft list of, of corridors in the regional transportation plan based on planning need. And so we're gonna kind of talk about that today That'll then inform the letter of interest process, and then we'll have selection um, and hopefully final approval later this summer. So like I said, we, we wanted to kind of develop a um, kind of a, it's not really like a ranked prioritization, it's really three big buckets of, of all the corridors in the regional transportation plan. These are the ones that we think there's kind of a high need that would be potentially good fits for the this Dr. Cog corridor planning program. Then there's some that are kind of medium, and then there's some that are maybe uh, lower need at the moment, maybe down the road um, as, the, as the region moves forward. So we, um, we've kind of drafted these, but we've, I'm looking for your feedback. So we had um, five kind of big buckets um, that we used to kind of think about what quarters would be a good fit for this planning program. So the first is the regional transportation plan staging period. So obviously corridors that are identified to be funded you know, in the nearer future, or of course have a higher need to kind of make sure they're ready to go than the ones that are in the later um, staging periods. Next, we wanted to think about regional impact. So we're a regional agency. We recognize that um, what we can bring to the table often is helping coordinate on those corridors that impact multiple cities, multiple counties, or on state roads. Um, so the number of impacted jurisdictions, but also the regional significance. Um, are there major employment centers? Are there major commercial centers? along the corridor that um, impact regional travel. 
Um, our third big bucket was equity. So Dr. Cog, um, as we've talked about in some of our previous um, TAC meetings, have had has had a big um, equity project over the last year or so. And out of that, there was a new Dr. Cog equity index. So we used that to look at parts of the region that had higher populations of historically underserved communities. Um, then we looked at the Metro Vision goals. Um, you can see some of those specific goals about uh, projected future population and job growth, high injury network, transit corridors, and then the complete streets prioritization work. And then last and maybe most importantly, we are really looking for the corridors where there's been a lack of previous planning work. So again, where there's kind of that need to do some additional deep dive planning on the corridor to move um, projects or some of the priorities forward. So um, this is kind of broad. We're not trying to make this an exact science, but we're trying to just kind of help shape um, that much bigger list of RTP corridors into something that's a little bit more manageable so we can start some conversations with you all to inform that letter of interest um, period. I will note there are a couple types of corridors that we decided maybe weren't the best fit for the corridor planning program at this time. Not to say that these aren't super important projects and corridors, but just in terms of what, what makes sense to fund through this set-aside program. So the first are those corridors for which um, another agency is already leading a planning effort. We don't want to, you know, um, step on each other's toes um, or for which a, a similar study has recently been completed. So again, you know, we know there's been a lot of great work around the region. The next kind of broad category are, are corridors for which the projects that are kind of identified in the transportation plan are already funded or under design or under construction. Um, uh, the third kind of category would be limited access um, roadways and freeways. And then last would be trails and multi-use paths. Um, again, not that those aren't important projects, but in terms of what kind of makes sense for this um, program that's focused on arterial corridors, those seem to be a little bit outside of the scope. So um, in your packet, we kind of have an initial draft list. Um, like I said, it's kind of broken into three major buckets. And these aren't the final selection. The idea here is this is just kind of a start of a conversation. So if you see a corridor that's on a high priority, um, this first slide, what we're basically saying is we'd like to probably talk to your jurisdiction, see what you think. Does this corridor feel like a good fit for the program? What else is going on? We want to learn more. Um, we obviously don't know everything that's going on in all the jurisdictions. So this is kind of an initial starting place. So you can kind of see the, the high priority ones here. Um, and then we have some medium priority, again, kind of looking at those five different um, criteria that we thought about and I showed earlier. And then the corridors that are kind of the, um, the lower priority have had maybe some work done on, on them or are kind of farther down in the, the staging period timeline. So I think I'm going to pause here because I am kind of curious um, if there's questions about either kind of our thinking in, in um, prioritizing the planning need of each of these corridors or about the process because it's a little confusing and it's a new process for us that we're trying out. So we wanted to make sure it made sense or if there are any questions you all had about the process. So I guess we'll take an initial pause to see if there's questions and turn it back over to our chair. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Uh, any questions for Dr. Cog staff? Um, I don't see any at this time. Um, any additional thoughts or comments from Dr. Cog? I will just put these back up here to kind of see, kind of prompt to see if there's any feedback. Do these factors feel like kind of the, the right factors to consider for a corridor planning program? Is there anything missing? Is there, are there any that don't, you don't understand what they are? Mr. Mormon. I, I think these are good. Um, I think this is, you know, once you get the program up and running, there may be something else that comes up, but I think your pilot program probably helped on this. And I think it's good to, to have a category like this as uh, we move forward that cross several jurisdictions. Great, I appreciate that. Yes, Mr. Fruzzi. Thank you. Um, one question that I have for you is a definition of lack of previous planning work because some of the work that is in the Dr. Cog RTP is planning that's already accomplished. So find that. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I will admit it's a 
somewhat subjective um, definition. We did try to kind of look within the last five years, um, you know, particularly if there's been kind of a major corridor or, you know, PEL type study within the last five years that covered that section that was in the, the long range 2050 RTP. That was kind of considered, you know, that, that quarter then had some planning work. Um, there were a number of quarters that either were in a larger transportation plan or maybe part of a, a larger vision um, that kind of we felt like we're kind of in, in between in terms of planning need. Um, and then, of course, if they already had a project going and or had, you know, funded, um, then that was kind of considered to be have, have no planning need at the moment. Good question, though. Mr. Rager? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a great answer from Noor. Just to add to it and, and to remind us to ground us in this program, the idea here, again, is these corridors, we're looking for corridors that, for whatever reason, they're important, they're priorities, they're in the plan, um, but for whatever reason, haven't had attention or dollars paid to them yet. They're at the very beginning of sort of that process. Maybe they're at the vision stage, that kind of initial corridor study phase. They haven't had a planning and environmental linkage study. They haven't had a NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act study. They just, they need some attention. They need some resources that they haven't gotten yet. Um, so these are really the corridors that we're trying to target and help take the lead on to move them forward. Mr. Schmitz? Yeah, I think these are actually a good list of them. One question is that in that regional impact, is there something with like, because I think this list does a pretty good job of like connecting, right, to other projects or other studies, and is there something in there about sort of that's part of that scoring mechanism, right, that, that connecting to other work or Colfax, for example? Yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, I, I kind of broke down the regional impact into two buckets. So first was just the number of jurisdictions especially because we know that makes sometimes planning even harder if you have, you know, three or four cities or a couple counties impacted. And then the second bucket is another one that's a little subjective. So I looked at where the urban centers are, um, looked at a little bit in terms of like, like transit ridership, where we know the, you know, the busiest transit routes are, and then a little bit of like, yeah, we feel like this quarter does connect kind of some major employment, civic, up, you know, locations. It's a little subjective, and I think that's why we're kind of looking for feedback. This isn't the end-all final selection, but um, kind of to what you talked about, if, if it felt like this was a core that really connected some big um, destinations or, you know, origins in, in the region, then we wanted to kind of consider them a little bit more. Yeah, and I'd add to that by saying that all of these corridors, because they're in the regional transportation plan, they're on what we call a regional roadway system, and that is by definition kind of some of those major corridors in the region that in part do connect. Um, they connect to other corridors, they connect to other projects. Um, so it is that kind of big regional system um, to begin with to even um, sort of, you know, classify to even be eligible as part of being one of these corridors. Ms. Mikkelbest. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just curious. Uh, I feel like you had a little bit of information about the screening process and the panel, but I don't see the slide in my deck. But so just wanted to be careful just listening to a lot of my constituents recently, a lot of our local agencies, I think some of them who are on the low may actually think they should be on the high list. And so um, just because you're in this document on a low list, if they apply, want to make sure there's not kind of a pre-assumed score that well on this and here they were low but then they can actually come out and be high if they have a good application Definitely. is that okay yeah and I appreciate you bringing <clears throat> that up you know this is just we wanted to kind of prompt some conversations and get some some ideas flowing which is why we decided to, to prioritize by need because we we have a good bit of money and we want to make sure we get the you know projects that have that need kind of are we have the project kind of um, bubble to the top but certainly if if you have a quarter that's in your community that you know something about, because again, this is based on our definitely in, incomplete knowledge, kind of as Dr. Cog staff. So if there's something going on, you know, major development, some some um, piece of information we don't have, we would definitely encourage you to apply um, and and tell us, you know, why it's an important corridor and why there's a kind of current high planning need to kind of do some additional work. So definitely appreciate that. The, the list is just kind of a general guide, but we're very open to um, feedback or ideas from, from jurisdictions. Thanks. Great. So I, I'll just flash back to the timeline. 
just to let everyone know, we will probably have a letter of interest that will open up um, within the next month or so, so keep an eye out for that. Um, I intend to keep it open a little bit longer, probably about six weeks, to kind of give some time for some conversations so we can talk with jurisdictions that um, might have a quarter that kind of is on one of our lists. Um, and then we'll probably be circling back in the August or September timeframe to hopefully uh, approve a first round of selections. So, Thank you, Ms. Kern. Additional questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Mr. Weart? The only thought I had, and again, I'm going back to my days working with a motor carrier for deliveries. Uh, a lot of these corridors are very congested and it makes it very difficult. And when you double park a tractor trailer out in the service lane, because there is no other place to park for deliveries, uh, I think you need to really consider goods and services, particularly for the local stores, whether it's a tavern that gets the delivery of product or uh, UPS delivering to a store. Just please don't lose sight of that. Uh, I can tell you horror stories of delivering on Colfax with tractor trailers. So, yeah, thank you. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that's the type of local knowledge that we don't necessarily have at a region to know where there's, you know, congestion lately from freight. So that would be a great thing to consider um, if you're nominating a corridor. Just sitting next to Wally, things are rubbing off on me, uh, not in the freight business, but, you know, you would think that during the evening C-470 would have more truck traffic than County Line Road, but that's not true because once they get off, they start making all their local services rather than get on and off the ramps at every exit. So you see a lot of uh, important corridors that are freight for regular delivery. And of course, those are fundamental to helping shift people to take shorter trips. We've got to get that goods and deliveries to those to shorten their commuter trips. Yeah, definitely um, would love to, if, especially, you know, we are focused on the corridors in the uh, regional transportation plan, but I know some of those are the, some key freight corridors, so we'd love to do some work on some of those corridors. I have a question. So for those that are on the excluded list, um, is that kind of like the end-all be-all, or are there opportunities, if you are on the excluded list and you have a reason to apply, that that can be brought up with Dr. Cog to access those funds? Yeah, I think that you definitely can apply. I mean, um, generally, I would say that the trails and limited access freeways, we're, we're pretty confident that maybe those aren't the best fit for this program because there's some other programs out there, and we want to kind of focus this program on the arterial corridors. But other than that, a lot of that's based on what we saw being funded through the TIP or what we kind of know in terms of planning processes. So if there's a new need, um, particularly we know, I mean, in planning studies, you can do one and then something totally new changes and you need to kind of rethink that corridor. So I would say if there's a corridor on the excluded, on the excluded list that you can have information about and want to put forward, we definitely would be open to consider that. Thanks. I wonder if maybe there could be language that would be a little softer than excluded because it sounds <laughs> um, pretty rigid. So maybe there's uh, another way to categorize those projects. Great point. I will do that. Mr. Rieger? Yeah, so just want to say thanks very much for the feedback. We'll definitely take that back as we move this forward. I just want to clarify, this is not an action item. It's an informational item, so no, no motion here, no official action. But we're looking for just an informal kind of consensus or head nod. If we were online, we'd ask you to give a thumbs up. So I think we've gotten that, but does anyone just want to give a thumbs up? Feels like we're on the right track with this? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. And if there are any specific questions, feel free to email me um, if you have questions um, as we kind of move towards that letter of interest. So, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Um, we will move on to item number seven, fiscal year 2023, Safe Streets and Roads for All, SS4A update. This is attachment E in your packet. Emily Kleinfelter, Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner.
Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am just going to give us a quick, quick little briefing today um, about the Safe Streets and Roads for All um, interest forms, or well, they're not even, yeah, I guess just forms that we received and give you a quick little briefing on the application that Dr. Cog intends to submit. Um, for those who are new to TAC um, and just for those who are, who are um, still here, we're just applying, uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All discretionary program um, is in its second year now of five years and um, the DOT has authorized a billion dollars basically per year um, for this program and there's no statutory minimum or maximum but the um, award sizes are expected to be anywhere between 100,000 up to 25 million um, and so Dr. Cog's staff uh, did put out a form asking for any of our member governments who are looking to submit an application to please um, inform us of that. And so Dr. Cog was uh, received five applications from different member governments. We have uh, four different member governments, the city of Boulder, the county of Boulder, Louisville and Denver who are gonna be submitting or planning on submitting applications uh, for implementation or construction funds uh, for their projects. I'll touch on those in just a moment. And then uh, the town of Lyons is submitting uh, an application to apply for an action plan for their jurisdiction. Um, and then additionally, Dr. Cogstaff is also working with our consultant team at HDR to pull together an application for the Dr. Cog region um, for a supplemental planning grant, which is part of the action planning work. Um, so a combined out of all of the total requested funding from those six different applications, it's estimated to be around um, almost $60 million that we're going to be applying for across the region. Um, I mentioned Dr. Cog is putting in an application and that is um, looking at working with um, a lot of our planning work that we've done over the years and our Complete Streets Prioritization tool that we published a few months ago. Um, we're, we're using that and the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero Plan crash profiles to identify um, two to three projects on uh, using three to four of those main crash profiles in each of the urban, each of the area types within Dr. Cog. So Dr. Cog, we have identified, has three main area types, urban, suburban, compact communities, and then rural. So our plan is to then focus on those uh, main crash types within those specific areas because understanding that the context of crashes can vary depending on the, the area of the region that you're in. And so uh, the plan is to then for us to identify two to three projects for each of those different crash profiles within those specific regions. Um, and so that planning work is to work with you all to identify those projects, um, setting ourselves up for hopeful um, funding to apply for the 24 or 25 year um, implementation funding so that we could then build out those projects. Um, I mentioned that there was, again, Town of Lyons is doing an action plan, which we're really excited to support. And then I actually just want to open the floor to those who are here from our member governments first, to if they wanted to speak on their um, applications. I see Jean is here and I know Alex is here as well. Um, I don't know if Garrett or anybody from Denver wanted to speak um, to their application, but I, I'd rather you all speak to it than, than me um, since it's your, your project. So um, if that's okay, if I could maybe first pass it over to Jean. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to Dr. Cog for all the technical support. So the application that we're preparing for the Safe Streets for All federal grant funding um, includes a package of projects throughout the city of Boulder. So last year, we adopted our Vision Zero Action Plan and identified um, crash patterns and crash modifi modification factors at some key intersections, mid-block crossings, and two um, high priority segments within the city. So one being 30th, the Northern section of 30th and one being a segment of Arapahoe where we would reconstruct to a complete street design. So it's really tailored towards improvements to our most vulnerable users, pedestrians, bicyclists, and um, those who are less abled. Um, and boy, it's really crunch time right now as many of you know. So <laughs> that's it in a snapshot. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the application Boulder County will be submitting is for median barriers on the two rural portions of US 27 in the county. Uh, so currently US 27 is a four lane highway that's experiencing what could best be described as an epidemic of crossover crashes. 
Um, we're averaging about four preventable fatalities a year over the past several years, and so our project would fund a solid barrier in the median to keep vehicles on the correct side of the highway. And that would be about 11 miles of median barrier. Thanks, Alex. Um, I wonder, do I have anybody from Denver or from Louisville here today? No? Sorry, y'all. I was stuck in the back. My apologies. So Jenna from Heartland City County of Denver. Um, so yeah, our application was for Morrison Road Construction Funds. It's a project that's under design in um, Westwood. I don't know if you're familiar with the neighborhood, but it's on our high injury network, and this will be a community changing project. I'm really excited for that one. Um, and then I, um, the city of Louisville you have in your packet, you can take a closer look at the description that they put in there. Um, but they are looking at putting uh, intersection and multimodal safety improvements along South Boulder Road, uh, CO4, Colorado 42. Um, lastly, just one note that those who did submit those letters, we will be providing a letter of support um, to all of those um, projects um, as long as they are meeting our Metro Vision plans. And as far as I can tell, they all do. So. Um, we will be working within staff to get those letters to you ASAP because those applications are due July 10th. So best of luck to all of our member governments that are putting those in. And we, um, we do know also that we um, will be hearing the results of these applications by the end of this calendar year. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Any questions? Can we good? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Emily, for that overview. Just wanted to clarify the committee for the committee. Again, this is an info item, not an action item. We have started doing this with the federal discretionary grants. We've done this with raise grants. Uh, we will continue to do this with the big discretionary grants that come out. It's not that we're asking for TAC's approval of any of these. It's that we wanted to bring them to you in transparency and in regional coordination. We wanted you all to see what your partners and neighbors are thinking of submitting for this particular grant program, in this case, SS4A, um, and to make sure that we stay coordinated as a region um, and aware of what our partners are doing. So it's really just for that coordination and transparency reason we felt anytime we have a big federal grant program like this, as I said, we're going to bring um, both an application we might be considering, but also all of you at local governments, just so together as TAC, uh, we can see that. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions, comments, or discussion? Uh, Mr. Griffith. I was wondering what was that price for that median barrier, just an estimate if you have an idea. It was 11 miles, you said? Uh, our current estimate is 21 million for the total cost. We'll be seeking a little under 17 from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Cog for bringing this agenda item and um, bringing transparency for all of these projects and good luck to everyone submitting applications. Uh, we will move on to our last agenda item here is ad administrative items. Um, so member comments and other updates. Um, Carson, if you're still here, yes you are. Uh, do you have an AMP uh, working group update for us? Sure, Madam Chair, I'll give you a one sentence update here. Um, uh, kind of earlier this month, uh, the AMP working group had a, a joint meeting with Dr. Cog's um, micromobility work group. They heard uh, from a panel about uh, various e-bike kind of incentives and programs and ideas from around the state. Um, in the meeting, Kaylee Fallon from Dr. Cog's staff was listed as kind of a contact. I would encourage you to reach out to her if you have questions or thought about, thoughts about e-bike programs around the state and in the region. Yeah. Um, any any other updates from members? Ms. Holting. Thank you. Speaking speaking of e-bikes, uh, Bicycle Colorado is currently working with League of American Bicyclists and People for Bikes to launch an online e-bike education program. And I will uh, be sending an email to TAC members to let them know it's coming in case. It's in case you're interested in it. And then uh, the long-awaited Bicycle Colorado Shift Driving Program is actually just about ready for launch. And that's a program uh, that we're really encouraging partners who have fleet drivers who want to make sure that they are bicycle-friendly drivers. It's a free online program that just educates uh, like both the legal and the best, best rules of the road for all users. So excited about both of those. And um, we're sending out an email later this week that I think most of you guys will get. Thanks. 
you, Ms. Holtine, for sharing that with the TAC. Any other updates, Ms. Simmons? Sorry, Ms. Lane. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to update everyone that Jefferson County is officially underway with our transportation and mobility plan update. Uh, so we will be conducting engagements starting really July 4th weekend um, through summer. So anybody that's interested, if you go to togetherjeffco.com, that's where kind of all of our engagement opportunities will be, um, will be posted. Thank you. Seeing none other, I want to thank Dr. Cog's staff for the luncheon today and um, coordinating the welcoming of our new TAC members. So welcome. And I'll pass it over to Jacob for some final comments. Yeah, thanks. Just a couple things from me. Uh, first of all, bike to work down Wednesday. Hopefully everyone's registered, but please, uh, please get out there and participate. We're really looking forward to it. We're excited about it this year. And then finally, yes, I wanted to add my thanks as well for all of you. This has been a great meeting. Really appreciate all being here. Uh, we look forward to working with all of you in the months ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Um, any final comments? Okay, seeing none, our next meeting is July 26, 2023. We'll see you here. And if you did not sign in, please make sure you check in at the back table to sign in. Um, make sure that we've captured your attendance. Thank you for participating today, and we are now adjourned at 3.12 p.m.